And uh, our next speaker is uh, Brian Endress. He's an associate professor of food and agricultural law in the College of Ag Consumer and Environmental Sciences. Let me get your stuff up there. <laughs> You know, my office is next door to Craig's uh, when I'm actually at that office. And uh, yeah, okay, thanks. I, and I obviously need to uh, talk to him some more about <laughs> Latin. Uh, the other opening comment I want to make is it's always hard to follow Craig's energy, especially <laughs> late in the afternoon. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best. I, wanted, I also want to thank Evan and Madhu for uh, giving me the liberty um, to come up here and, and sort of change directions a little bit and talk about law. And sometimes I wonder why I get stuck on these panels and I think, well, we like Brian, we want him to be part of the conference, so we'll just try to squeeze him in somewhere. So thank you for taking the, making the effort to squeeze me in here um, a little bit. Interestingly, um, my current position at the university and why I don't see Craig too much is that I'm doing international uh, affairs um, as an administrator. And, uh, but my talk today is all about local. <laughs> the exact opposite, local and, uh, and a few other things. And actually my uh, presentation today is based on three, uh, three different papers I've written over the last couple of years. One focusing on organics and the regulation of organics. The second on uh, litigation surrounding use of the label term natural uh, and what that really means. And then uh, more recently, uh, what do we mean when we say local? And, uh, and looking at it from the consumer perspective. And then taking it because this is about sustainability, uh, what can we learn from those three experiences in the food law context uh, as we start to think about what does sustainable mean in the context of food and maybe even a food label? Um, one of the th other things I'm doing now, uh, because I no longer sleep, is uh, working as a standards committee member for uh, an ANSI, American National Standards Institute approved process to develop uh, sustainability standards for the production of food. Um, and I'm also happy to say that I'm not alone at the University of Illinois working on this. There's two other faculty members here who are also standards committee members. Um, but what's unique is we're the only university to have more than one person. And I think it also shows the, the, the dedication and the passion and the commitment to sustainable food production here um, with at the University of Illinois. Okay, trying to do this. This is an educate. This this audience is, is really good. So I'm going to skip through this agricultural production context uh, slides or, or move really quickly. We all know there's a declining number of farms. The intensity is increasing. This Jeffersonian ideal of a citizen farmer, with the exception of perhaps West Gerald in the back, is is long past. Um, I do want to note that he thinks he talks about uh, wealth, happiness, and of course good morals, um, which is important. The disconnect between consumers and producers. And this is where I, I hope to spend most of my t uh, a few minutes here talking about. Uh, but then keeping in mind that agriculture is the primary driver, uh, economic driver in many rural communities. So the first of the three, the three parts. Uh, the organic story, and this I'll, I'll provide what I'll call the abbreviated version, focusing on the label. And if you think about it, the label, at least in my perspective, is the primary means of communication between the person who's, who's producing, distributing, and ultimately selling the food product and the consumer, the, the buyer. And so the, I think the importance of creating an organic label has, has not been really uh, uh, well developed in the literature uh, so far. And why, did, why, was, why is this label so important? It's just this green and white sort of thing you see on, on some packages, uh, or sometimes it's black and white, actually. Um, but if you go, if you take a step back and you look at how this label came about, it was because of a lot of confusion in the marketplace for organic products. You had laws in California, for example, that had if you follow these production practices, you can call your product organic. And then you had a different set of laws in Oregon and in Colorado and in a few other states out west. Um, but then for the economists in the market, it, it becomes quite, or in the audience, they realize right away, well, how do you conduct trade if you have different standards across different jurisdictions? Um, and then if you're a farmer, well, you know, how are you going to be ac able to access if you're farming organic, you know, something in Oregon, you want to sell it to the San Francisco market where they're going to pay triple and be happy with it. So um, that, that was one aspect of why you needed this, uh, some sort of federal standardization of the organic label. And the other thing was, frankly, there was a lot of uh, outright fraud. People would just label things organic and sell it and, you know, and to some extent that may or may not go on today. Um, so 
the Senate got together and, and, uh, and debated for several years to create what is organic. And, um, and that the eventual angst that went into this was, was actually a good thing because you had a standardized process that now could go forward and you can't call a product organic unless you follow these principles. Um, but I don't want to uh, minimize the social movement that went behind organics. Um, and I mentioned, you know, California, Oregon, and a lot of what I'll call the left coast. And at the same time, this sort of, there was a back to the land movement. There was a lot of other things going on that were focused, you know, not on what is organic, but actually what does it mean to grow and produce food and, and, to, and to do it in an environmentally way, a socially conscious way, uh, to respect uh, the rights of the workers, and to make sure that uh, the workers are paid a fair amount of wage and that you as the farmer get a fair wage. It sounds an awful lot like what is fair trade nowadays and some of the outgrowth of the early organic movement is spun off into fair trade. Um, but then we get to, you know, when the government gets involved, they tend to, to muck things up to some extent. And the USDA's position on organics is that it's a, it's a marketing tool and a mass marketing tool that's used to justify price premiums. And, uh, and quoting actually from the statute, the purpose of the uh, organic, uh, or the Organic Food Production Act is to establish standards for marketing assure consumers of these standards, and facilitate interstate commerce. So it's not talking about the environmental benefits that may or not be associated with organics. It's not talking about, you know, the feel good that consumers might have. It's, it's, it's just pure on the economics of this. And to the extent that the USDA is measuring the success of the organic program, it's all about market growth. It's not how many fewer pesticides were used or how many cattle were, you know, uh, raised in, a, in what might, may or may not be a more humane way. So that's sort of the organic and uh, the early parts of the organic. And then as it's evolved, I, the way I view it is you have big organic and organic as a religion. I wish Mike Mazzocco, a, a colleague of mine who, who was retired from the university, was here. He coined this organics as a religion uh, theme. And I, and I just love it because as you talk to people in the industry, it's really quick to figure out, are you talking to someone from General Mills or Kellogg or Walmart? Or are you talking to someone who believes in organic, the movement? And they view it as, as you know, religion may well be too strong, but uh, nonetheless, it, I think it really does accurately reflect what is going on in the organic industry, where there is a fear that it's, the big organic is nothing but just a hybrid of conventional agribusiness. And there's arguments in favor of that. And, and then, of course, there's, there's criticisms of that. And it all really came to head in this, this lawsuit called Harvey versus Veneman. And it had a lot, of, uh, a lot of things were going on. Basically, it was a farmer named Harvey who sued the Secretary of Agriculture, Veneman at the time, about w the enforcement and what really the organic regulations meant. And part of it circled around the conversion of dairy cattle uh, to, from conventional to organic. And it also talked about the ability of organic certification organizations that go about and certify to this government standard whether they can add on additional requirements that if you want to certify by Brian Endress's organic certification company, I can require some of these additional things that may not be in the statute, such as fair labor practices or, or other things like that. Um, now, a person wouldn't have to come to Brian Endress's organic uh, certification um, uh, company to do it. They could go to another company. But the court said, no, the certif certifiers are bound to only certify to the law and they can't add anything else. And so that, of course, upset those from the organics as a religion camp, so to say, because that just threw out all of these social standards from the organic label. What was, all the, what was more frightening, I think, in some respect, was that then the, uh, they actually won, the, the sort of the small organics won on the conversion to dairy cattle issue, but then the industry went to Congress and lobbied very quietly and got the statute changed. And they got the statute changed without a hearing, without anything else. It was actually slipped in, uh, literally at midnight, uh, on on a on a floor on the floor of the of the uh, of the Senate to to change the law. And if you think about the power of consumers to be involved and to own the organic label, versus you know what we the the standard critique of of uh, of big moneyed interests, you know that that was just a, a perfect storm. Of, uh, of or big organic versus the organic as a social movement. And so going forward, what you're going to continue to see are the, the result from this intra-industry division between big versus small in the organics. 
I think we'll skip this in the interest of time. Let's go on to local. What does local mean? Uh, a good friend of mine, Marnie Coit, summed up the local foods movement, and it's really about individuals making conscious decisions on why and how they are eating particular foods. And that she identified these goals of connecting consumers to the people who grow the foods, and then if you look at that, all of these other things that go along with it, uh, fresh, high quality products, uh, supporting growers who produce food uh, in an economically sustainable way, support for local producers, economic growth in rural communities, those sorts of things. But my question is more from a legal perspective. What does local mean? Um, when I go to supermarkets, I'm always looking at labels. And this is from the, our local Meyer sells these green bell peppers, $1.99 a pound, and it says they're homegrown. What the heck is homegrown mean? <laughs> I, I, it wasn't grown in my home, and I don't think Meyer has a home that they're growing things out of. And so how can they put this label on? Well, you can put a label on anything unless it's regulated. And my, the, the punchline here is local is not regulated. Local could mean, and here's some actual laws where they sprinkled in what local means within the state borders. Uh, Food Safety Moderniza Modernization Act, Farm Bill, and Walmart says if it's within a state's borders, we're going to call that local. Uh, less than 400 miles is another part of the Farm Bill. You can see that, you know, that sometimes they're not always the same. Neighboring states, up to 275 miles. Safeway, nearby. <laughs> you know, I, li I like that one. Um, so, okay, but then what, this is what it means maybe from the Walmart, Safeway, other things. But consumers, what, when, when a consumer, the average consumer or you goes out there and you see local, what do you think it means? And, and the literature is really showing that it means a lot. There is no set miles, okay? And you can even go to our local food co-op and they sort of define local in a variety of different ways. Um, depending on often the food product, you know, and I mean, could you ever have local bananas in Illinois? Well, probably not. I don't know. But um, you can see that local is a lot more nuanced than just uh, something about miles. Um, but then this local concept has, has also spawned a lot of what I'll call direct farm business opportunities, and some of those are listed here that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And many of these, uh, in these farms that are trying to access this local market are doing not just one or two, but maybe a, a bunch of these. All right, and um, but there are some legal barriers to entry. We won't get, in the interest of time, won't get into a lot of these, but I think uh, in some survey work I've done with farmer operating a, a CSA, this is not the local, any of the local CSAs. This was someone actually in Wisconsin. Uh, my head's in the sand when it comes to rules and regulations. They're just worried about getting the produce out and on time to the consumers. And I think that is a big part of some of the legal issues wrapped up in local foods is that the small farms are trying to push for what they'll call small farm exceptionalism and scale appropriate regulations and then on the other hand you have a government apparatus that doesn't really know what to do with local foods and all these small farms that are accessing this market in a variety of very much micro ways. Um, this is just an interesting thing from Choices Magazine in 2011 where they talk about the various factors when choosing for fresh produce and you can see locally grown is down there third from the, third from the bottom on there. Um, actually uh, above organically grown, which is interesting. Cottage food industry bills as, is another player on the legal side in this sort of local food production. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, if you're going to produce some sort of processed food item, let's say you're making the apples into applesauce, you have to comply with all these food safety regulations. What cottage food bills have done is trying to reduce this or eliminate entirely the food safety regulatory apparatus for people who are making applesauce in their kitchen and selling it. Um, and it's, a, it's about stimulating this small local food production. And actually, if you go to our farmer's market, you'll see a lot of, uh, of the products that are sold there fall under the Illinois as a cottage food bill right now. Natural. This is probably my favorite area because it's full of litigation. And before I joined this academia thing, I was a litigator. So that, but the, the key thing is, what does natural mean? And the, what's curious is the FDA has repeatedly refused, even though courts have specifically asked the administrator of the FDA. They put a case on hold for six months while they sent a letter to the FDA and said, please define the word natural. And then eventually a letter will come back, we're not going to do it at this time, it's too complex. 
And so the, course, the courts are then left to try to figure it out. And so what you have now is an ongoing array of class action lawsuits challenging all these various labeling claims dealing with all natural and food products that are falling under state consumer protection laws. These are not food labeling laws or food safety laws. They're the general consumer protection laws that are out there. Not surprising, a lot of these are in California, but also New Jersey, Michigan. They're, they're popping up all over the place. And my position is that if you, a federal definition from the FDA would come in and actually define natural, you could get rid of a lot of this. It would preempt it in the legal, in the legal sense. But it's not happening. And so you're, con you're continuing to see this artificial ingredients, skinny girl mar margarita mix, had some clearly artificial ingredients, uh, yet was claiming all natural. And it was being uh, sold at Whole Foods, and so there was a, there was a double whammy there. Um, highly processed ingredients. High fructose corn syrup is always in the debate. Is it or is it not natural? And it has to do with how much processing does something have to go through before it, it's no longer considered natural in the minds of the average consumer. Um, and you can see some other words. Ben and Jerry's, uh, five million dollars. They had, they lost, or they settled in a, in a class action settlement. And Breyer's, at only two and a half million uh, for the use of uh, alkalized cocoa is what got both of those. But here's the latest one is GM products. Frito-Lay and General Mills uh, are the subject of lawsuits right now where they're using just corn, soy, and, and sugar beets, which happen to be genetically modified. Are those or are those not still natural products? And that's, uh, that's something that is, that is uh, still subject to, uh, to debate. So now I'm bringing all these things around to sustainable. And what does it mean? And will sustainable be the next natural in that if someone wait until someone puts that sustainable label on their product, uh, what sort of legal challenges are going to come? And are they going to come from the commodity industry that might be suffering some sort of loss of a market share? Or is it going to come from consumers because of the inability of a certification system, whatever it might be, to satisfy their consumer expectations? Um, if you think about sustainability, that's a pretty broad concept. And how can you capture all of that into a product label? But it's my prediction that the class action plaintiff's bar, meaning the consumers, is going to, going to be the target, while the commodity industry will simply apply, apply pressure within agencies and legislatures where it has a competitive advantage to do that, to come up with some sort of, of clarity on what is sustainable. Um, but then another concept is, if there is no definition of sustainable, you know, how can the consumer be misled? But if the Leonardo, uh, the, this ANSI certified process actually comes up with a, a, a definition of sustainable that could be foods could be certified too. Does that now create a benchmark for future lawsuits? You know, and I don't think that's necessarily a reason not to go forward, but it is an interesting way to to think about sustainability. So a few just legal perspectives that uh, that I've had the pleasure of sharing with you all uh, today, and I think I have a couple minutes left. So thank you very much. Hey, Brian, given the um, decidedly structured nature of the organic certification and the decidedly unstructured approach to the term natural, what would you argue for, uh, where on that continuum would you think local ought to be? Would you argue in favor of a federal definition or would you rather stay out of that? Uh, <laughs> depends on how much business I want to drum up. Yeah. You know? I mean, no, but I, I, to, in all honesty, I, I do think that um, local needs to have some sort of a, of a definition. And I'd even be willing to accept it at a state level. I think what means local in California uh, is very different than, than maybe local in Illinois. Let's just take Chicago, for example. You can't say local means the state of Illinois because their food shed is Wisconsin, Michigan, and Indiana, and sort of it's that, it's that whole area. So I would like to see um, a more of a state-by-state -state perspective on local that would eliminate some of these uh, potential for the, the state-based consumer confusion claims. Wouldn't the economists still be pissed at you? There, there are, <laughs> you know, there's not very many lawyers in the, in the department. My department head's in the back, so I'm used to being pissed off, people being pissed at me, so, yeah. Good. Other questions? I think, did Evan, you have one, or? 
Oh. And then we'll... Oh, yeah, I'll take Bruce. It was more of a comment. You've absolutely ruined my next trip to the supermarket. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be at a loss. So, 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 am I to understand that organic is a is an economic and marketing classification and has nothing to do with the way that product was produced? I think that's the underlying motivation behind it. But of course, it is at the end of the day a process-based standard. It's not a product-based standard. Um, and so in order to get that organic label, you have to follow this process. The argument is, well, what does the process really mean? And are there exemptions in the, in the process that it's not meeting what most consumers believe it really means? Yeah. Bruce? Yeah. Which is consumers yeah. have a right to get what they pay for. Right. But they don't. Right. Uh, I, I could, I'm coming at this as someone, as a food toxicologist who sat on the FDA Food Advisory Committee. When they look at the word natural, and you may well know this, it doesn't inform the FDA about safety, about quality, about wholesomeness, or anything else. It's an immaterial to the consideration. They therefore believe that a definition of the word natural is a, is a policy decision that should be made elsewhere. It's not, it's not for the FDA to tell people what's natural since it's meaningless as far as FDA is concerned. Moreover, if they were to define it, they would define everything on the face of the earth as natural because it was found here and put together into a food product. I just. I'm just going to push back on you because I like a good debate, and that's what this is about. But yes, it's absolutely a policy decision, but if not the FDA, who? And that's exactly what agencies are put in place to do, is to sometimes make these policy decisions, guided by what the underlying statute says. Okay, the and motivation is they're chicken, because they know no matter how they define it, they're going, they're going to be in a vicious crossfire. I, I, I agree with yeah. you, totally. I mean, it, it's, they don't want to make a policy decision and bear the brunt of what happens. Right. Because they, they're, they're, they know for sure that some very motivated, caring people who ideologically are attached to the word natural will not be very happy with what they come up with as a definition. And by the way, since you like to litigate, can we litigate about whether organic is sustainable? I can think of some good cases. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> We can definitely talk about that. Do we? Have, okay. One last question, and then, and then we'll take do it at the end. If there are other questions. Maybe. Well, Mr. Lawyer, this is this is a, a bit of a plea to also to the audiences. Um, as a scientist, uh, label organic is is very funny uh, <clears throat> because we are mostly organic, uh, but and and chemicals. Well, obviously, organics are chemical and all that. But put all that science uh, stuff outside. I think the real uh, confusing factor that we have heard today is the use of chemicals, lumping, fertilizers, and pesticides together. First, again, on chemistry, most pesticides are actually organic, <laughs> not, a, not an organic. But the point is, fertilizers are something that are needed to grow crops, while pesticides and so on are more like medicine in case the plant gets sick. And I wish this distinction would be realized uh, a little bit more, not just to lump them all as awful chemicals. Thank you. I, yeah, I think I, I've not, I haven't honestly uh, thought about the distinction between the two, but I might talk to Evan about that because <laughs> I know you've done a, quite a bit of work on, on those sorts of fertility issues, but thank you very much. Yeah. Illinois.